Well, I guess we might as well kick off and start. Um, hi, I'm Scott Holden, and welcome to What's That Fruit? Now, I was going to do a really, really serious technical deep dive talk, but where's the fun in that? So I thought, let's have a little bit of fun to start off with. And let's play a classic, classic game of What's That Fruit? Come on, audience participation. Does anyone know? Yell it out. Apple. Apple. <sighs> Too easy. All right. Let's try a little bit of a harder one. What's that fruit? Orange. Amazing work. Oh, this is brilliant. Now, as with any sort of series, you start with the original characters and then it gets extended. So in this case, it's what's that fruit or veg? I love the thought that bacon is a vegetable, but no, no. Pickle, getting closer. Carrot? It's a carrot. Now, everyone that answered correctly, come up afterwards. I've actually got the actual fruits here as prizes for you. So, what's that fruit? It's a little bit of an interesting concept. We were pretty easily, be, we were able to identify those fruit quite easily just from the shadows, but what does it mean for a computer to recognize those individual pieces. Um, I'd like to start off with a little bit about who I am. So I'm a technical specialist at Microsoft focusing in Azure application development. Twitter, GitHub, my personal life story. Was ops, then dev, now DevOps focused with a love for sec DevOps. And to be perfectly honest, if it was up to me, it'd be sec dev, sec ops, sec, because there's not enough security in the world. It's need to think about it at all steps. Um, a little bit of a disclaimer before we actually drill deep into things. Um, I'm a developer at heart, so this is going to be a very developer-centric session. We're not going to look at hardcore machine learning. We're going to look at instead how do we take traditional developer practices and use services instead of becoming data scientists. And on that point, I'm not a data scientist. I love learning about machine learning, deep learning, and all this fun stuff, but I don't spend my days crunching numbers. The opinions are that of my own, not of that, that of my employer. I have to say it. This talk is labeled, what's that fruit? But we will be covering both fruit and vegetables. So we've already got scope creep there. Um, I was going to title it, what's that vegetable? But not as catchy. And what's that organic matter? Just doesn't have the same appeal to it. Some fruit was bruised during the making of this presentation, and I do apologize for that, but we'll continue on anyways. I want to actually start off with a little bit of a story about how this talk came to be and how the proof of concept that it kind of underpins actually originated. So I was walking down the street on the way to my weekly, weekly shopping session at the supermarket. Go in, pick up all my fruit and veg, only bought fruit and veg this time, and headed over to a self-serve checkout. Has everyone used a self-serve checkout before? It's nearly mandatory these days. They only have one other lane open. And I went through and started unloading things item by item. And put down an avocado, flicking through the menu, flicking through the menu. Oh, no. I put it through as a carrot. Obviously, I need a little bit of machine learning in my life. But I mean, what does that really mean? Well, carrots are $2.20 a kilo. An avocado masquerading as carrots was 75 cents. An actual avocado, they were on sale this day, so it was $2.50 each. That's a $1.75 difference. Now, just so everyone knows, I did call over the shop attendant and say, hey, I've made a mistake, and I actually paid for both items in the end. But it got me thinking. How much of an issue could this be? So I went, like any good, any good person would, and went straight to a data source, Avocados Australia, and looked up the number of avocados produced and sold in any one year. And doing a little bit of a back of the envelope, uh, back of the napkin calculation, 600 ton, uh, sorry, 60,000 tons of avocados, 341 grams per avocado, $2.20 a kilo for carrots, if only 1% of sales are put through as carrots, that's $3 million a year. That's a lot of avocados masquerading as carrots. So 
as part of this, I've put together a little bit of a proof of concept around um, self-serve checkouts and how you can use object detection and image recognition at the edge to actually pick up fraudulent behavior. Turns out a lot of people are actually doing similar things to this. And I love the wording, elaborate self-serve checkout scam. So someone said AI. Where does AI fit into this? Well, as you've probably guessed already, we're really talking about loss detection and prevention. How can we detect that the user's doing something different to what we expect, putting avocados through as carrots? But this is only part of the bigger, uh, part of the bigger issue. And I mean, at the end of the day, we shouldn't just be thinking about this component, but we should also, we should also be thinking about accessibility. What if someone physically can't select avocados from the menu? They don't understand what the options are or how to interact with it. Wouldn't it make a lot more sense to have machines make those decisions for us and then just prompt to say, is this what you expected to buy? So machine learning, huzzah. We can fit computer vision into this. We can actually get a computer to recognize what an object or an item is. And I want to break it down into two very distinct categories that we'll look at separately. Image classification. This is saying, this is an image of an apple. This is an image of an orange. This is an image of a man in a park with a dog. An object detection, which breaks it down a little bit further and actually tells you the location of the apple within the image. And there's a distinct separation of these two because image classification you can get started with not, not a lot of data, very little annotation and labeling. Whereas object detection requires a little bit more thought around how you actually annotate your data. So instead of doing anything from scratch, we're gonna look at what we can use off the shelf for this. And because I'm a Microsoft kind of guy, I turn to the Azure Cognitive Services Suite. These are a series of services that are basically exposed as REST APIs you can consume them to do some pretty cool things. If you ever wanted to work with vision, so in our case, image recognition, if you ever wanted to do speech to text, text to speech, linguistic analysis, natural language understanding, translation, knowledge search, cognitive search, all this sort of cool stuff, you don't need to understand the science behind it. You can simply consume it as a service. What I want to start off with is actually looking at the computer vision. And the computer vision is a general image classification service. So if we were to come along to the, where are we? Cool. If we come along to the Azure home page, um, go to products, cognitive services, and choose computer vision, this pops up. And this is actually a live demo on the website that you could be playing with. And the whole idea here is we provide an image and we get back a description of what the image is of. So in this case, we've got an image of a train and a platform and some people. And we can see the tags in the side represent the train, platform, station, building, indoor. We can gain context about what this image is. And in fact, it'll even give, generate a text description of the image. People waiting at a train station. Now, we can click through to a whole lot of different sample images to see what it looks like, but it's a lot more fun if we actually give one of our own images. So I'm gonna give it a photo of an apple because we were all fantastic at actually recognizing an apple. How will a computer go? Well, we pass it in and it's recognized it as an apple indoor, but, oh, there we go. And the text says a green apple. So it successfully recognized an apple, and this is fantastic. Our problem solved. We don't have to do any more work. But what if we gave it something a little more complex? Say, for example, an avocado. Well, because the computer vision service is quite generalized, it doesn't have every single entity in the world. And in this case, it doesn't actually know what this object is. It knows that it's indoors and on a table but it can't actually recognize that it's an avocado. So the computer vision service, while it's fantastic for recognizing general objects, it doesn't cater for domain specific objects. So let's jump back now. 
Computer vision, as I said, generic categories. So there's 86 taxonomy categories at the top with a whole lot of different object types underneath. It's great for general recognition, as I say, the men playing frisbee in the park style scenario, but it's not so good for domain specific imagery. We really want to recognize a wide range of fruit and vegetables, not just an apple. So this is where custom vision comes in. And custom vision is another cognitive service where we can actually provide our own data sets. Instead of using an off the shelf model, we can provide our own data and have the service train a machine learning model on our behalf. And we consume it in exactly the same way, just via a REST API. So custom vision, you bring your own data sets. This means we could train it on any fruit and veg we actually have an image of. And it can be as small as a dozen images. And the reason for this is that it actually uses transfer learning, feature extraction, and magic under the hood. So it's not retraining an entire model from scratch. You'll often hear data scientists say, well, we're going to need 50,000 images to start off with, and I expect 200,000 to get a model with half decent accuracy. That's if you're going from scratch. If you can take a pre-built generic model, break off the last couple of layers, and feed your own information into it, you can actually get amazing results without large, large data sets. And on top of this, it's as a service. So as I said before, it's a REST API we interact with. I love this, is it, a ser is it serverless? I mean, we don't have servers, we don't care about scale, we don't care about infrastructure. You could kind of call this serverless to a degree. Um, a side note on data preparation though, it is 90% of the work. Even though we're not data scientists, it does take a lot of time. Um, custom vision will take care of a lot of the easy tasks for you, so resizing, cropping, duplicate detection in training data, storage of the images, but you still actually, you're still responsible for data accuracy. If you've labeled a banana or an apple, it's not gonna fix that for you. So data prep is still important. So let's actually build something. Let's actually start playing around with the custom vision service. So if we head across to customvision.ai, you can log in and every single Microsoft account actually has a couple of free projects. So you don't actually even need to spin up any resources in Azure to get started. When you want to look at productionizing, you can look at then spinning up backing resources as appropriate. So I'm going to come in here and I've got a couple of pre-prepared demos in case the world burns down and the live demos don't work. Demo gods be with us. Um, Let's do a live demo. And instantly it pops up with a whole lot of options. Instead of using a trial for this, I'm actually going to pay for this one. Um, we can choose project types. And the project types really come down to, are we doing image classification or object detection? You remember I split it out into those two categories before? This is actually kind of an important part. We'll come, back to, come around to object detection a little bit later on. But for the moment, we'll go classification. We then have the idea of classification types. This is, could there be two items in an image, or will it only ever be a photo of one thing? So could there be a cat and a dog in the same image, or will the photo ever be only be of a cat or of a dog? So in the computer vision we saw before, it returned a whole lot of different labels. So that would be multi-label. If we could guarantee we'd only ever see one item in an image, then multi-class would be more applicable. The domains finally down the bottom, this really comes into the whole idea of the base model that's used to specialize into your model, where should it be based? Should it be just a general model similar to the computer vision model? Or should it be something that's already seen landmarks or food? Um, the adult one's actually rather interesting you can do adult image classifications on top of this to say, is this a racy image? Is this an adult image? Should it be blocked? Should it be over 18, under 18, that sort of thing. The compact domains we'll come back to a little bit later because that's a little bit more of an interesting concept. But we'll click Create Project and boom, we're done. We're ready to go. So this is the same as writing a couple of hundred lines in Python of setting up TensorFlow, setting up where you're actually going to feed data from, how the model actually is structured. And it was one click, super easy. From the portal though, we can then add images in. So 
I'm going to go ahead and add a single picture of a carrot. And it's going to pop up and ask us, well, what is this image of? And I'm going to say, it's a carrot. And upload a file. So this is going to upload it, tag it, annotate it, and store it on the custom vision service. Now, you can imagine if we had we had 100 photos of fruit, doing that one by one is very laborious. And it just so happens that this website under the hood is using the same custom vision API that you get access to. So if we want to automate it instead, we can actually use, where are we? here we go, the custom vision training Nougat package in C Sharp. There's a um, Node.js equivalent, which allows us to actually upload images in batch or in bulk automatically. So if you've got a data lake where you've got existing data ready to, ready to pull in, you can do that programmatically. So what we're doing here is setting up our custom vision configuration. And we'll grab the project ID in a second. We're going to cache any tags that already exist, because we don't want to begin tagging things twice. We're then going to go through all of the folders on my computer in terms of where my images are stored create the tag if it doesn't exist, and upload all the files. And we're going to upload the files as a batch. As you can imagine, doing everything one by one is OK when you've got 30 images. But when you've got 300, 400, 500, 1,000 sort of thing, it does take a while. So in order to hook this up, I just come back to the custom vision portal, come across, and grab the project ID, and replace it with the project ID listed here. Kicking, whoop, wrong project to start. Cool. Kicking this off will then grab all those images and batch load them into the custom vision service. I'm not exaggerating when I say everything you can do in the custom vision service, you can do programmatically. Everything is exposed as an API. The whole idea here is that the interface you use is just exposing those APIs in a user-friendly way. So this is going to go through now and upload all those images with the tags that I've specified. And the way I've actually sorted my fi uh, photos is a folder, which is the tag's name, and then the images within them. And there we go. We're uploaded and ready to go. So if we come back here and have a look at our training images again, we should actually have about 307, 308 images in total. All of these tagged as, well, in this case, it's a potato. Now, at this point, we've got our images annotated and sitting in the custom vision portal. We now actually need to train the machine learning model. Now, it's quite complex. We come up to the train button, we click, and we wait about 30 seconds or so. This is one of the really nice things around custom vision. You don't have to worry about infrastructure under the hood. You don't have to spin up a VM. You don't have to maintain a stack. The service provisions and runs that infrastructure behind the scenes for you. So at no point have we actually used a VM at this stage. And we're good to go. Now, I'm going to turn the probability threshold up a little bit. And you see we have a precision and a recall. This is interesting. So the whole idea of precision is given a tag appears on an image, how likely is that tag to be correct? So given we have an image and it shows up with the tag potato, how likely is it that it's actually a potato? Our recall is, given that tag popped up, what confidence was it that it was a potato? And we'll drill into confidence in a second. So you can see here that we've trained this up and we're good to go. If we wanted to actually start, call, to start calling this API, we can click on the prediction URL, and it gives us all the information there ready to get started. So that's a complete image classification machine learning model from data input, training, productionizing, and monitoring in give or take four or five minutes. It's quite easy to get started. Now, to test it out quickly, I'm going to click on the quick test button. and give it a file that it's actually never seen before. So all the images that I've put up so far have been fairly, well, 
They've been designed to just show the object itself. They've been on white backgrounds with reasonable lighting. So what happens if I actually give it something that has poor lighting? Corners are black, and you can see here that it's picked it up as a carrot with 91% confidence. So the model itself is 91% confident that there's actually a carrot in this image. Likewise, if we give it an avocado, we have an 88% confidence that this image is of an avocado. These, these predictions are what we basically use to determine, are we confident with what it's predicted? And what thresholds do we set on top of that? So you will ne you'll most likely never end up in a scenario with 100% confidence, unless you're feeding in the same images that it's been trained on. At most, you'll end up with 99 point something. So that's building the model, training it, and executing it. Jump back over here for a second. So what if we actually wanted to run this on the edge rather than in the cloud? Having an API available to actually evaluate and predict these images is great, but not everywhere has amazing bandwidth. We can't be expected to stream live video up to the internet, especially if in a self-serve kiosk style scenario, you might have 30 or 40 within a single location. So we can actually look at running these machine learning models that are built and trained in the cloud on the edge. And for a little bit of a demonstration today, I've got a Raspberry Pi up the front here, so a fairly low powered device. And we're gonna take this machine learning model that we just trained and push it down to the Raspberry Pi. And we've got a little webcam here that we can point at a couple of different bits of fruit. So how do we actually, how do we actually put this together? Well, I could take the custom vision component and just push it onto the Raspberry Pi directly. But if we want to look at actually doing this at scale, we need a way to manage a large number of devices configurations across multiple locations, across, um, across multiple, well, multiple geographic locations with different configurations, possibly in disconnected states, so whether they only have partial access to the internet. And it just so happens there's a service that does it, does this for us, the Azure IoT Hub. So an Azure IoT Hub really looks at device telemetry and configuration for IoT devices. There is an extra part to it though, which is particularly interesting when it comes to edge compute. And that's the IoT Edge. IoT Edge is a small framework that you can run on low power devices right through to physical servers that allows you to centrally configure a large number of edge devices with any sort of configuration you want. And in our case, we can actually push a Docker container from the Azure portal down to the Raspberry Pi without ever actually touching the Raspberry Pi itself. We could do this on scale for thousands and thousands of devices, or in our case, just do it for one as a bit of a test. So let's actually dive in and run with this. So before we saw that there were a couple of different sorts of domains, we had our general domain, our food domain, but we also had a series of compact domains. And these compact domains represent a slightly smaller model that's designed for offline usage. So if we were to change this to general compact, it's now gonna change the way it actually builds up and trains this model behind the scenes. So if we save changes and come in and retrain this model, it's now going to use a different base model and enable a couple of extra options for us. The most important one in our case is actually the ability to export this model so we can use it wherever we want. Hopefully this will take a couple of seconds and we'll be good to go. There are a couple of different formats that we can actually export it into, and it really comes down to where you're actually going to be running this model. There are options for different phones if you wanna run it on Android and iOS. There's an option for um, Windows ML and Onyx. So if I click on the export button now, we'll get all those different platform options 
But the one I'm really interested for today is down the bottom here, Dockerfile. We can actually export our model and a scaffolded program ready, ready to execute. There's really nothing we need to do for it. So if we click on Dockerfile, I'm going to specify that I actually want to run it on a Linux host. And it's going to go off and prep everything for me. So behind the scenes, it's going to convert it from its internal format into a TensorFlow frozen graph. So any way you use TensorFlow, you can actually use this model. And it's also going to include, as I said before, that scaffolding application. And that's made up of a Flask API written in Python, which allows us to call this model in the same way we call the custom vision service. So if we were to open up the, the exported file, we'll actually find that there's a couple of different bits and pieces inside there. So it's come straight out of the box with a Docker file. It's got a folder containing our application code, as well as, uh, it's not going to zoom in. Um, you just have to take my word for it. It's got a couple of Python files in the actual frozen model itself. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to change the way this actually builds and executes. So it uses a saved base image instead of building everything up from scratch. So within the Docker file, I'm just going to come in and modify the from image to one that I've already prepared and remove the requirements installation. So if we were to build this straight away, we'd have no issues at all. But it'd take about well, 20 minutes or so to actually install all the prerequisites, because it actually pulls down a copy of TensorFlow, pulls down a copy of OpenCV, NumPy, and a couple of pretty heavy components. So by using an existing base image, we can actually speed up that deployment process. And that's probably one of the big takeaways from today. If you are looking at using this in a production scenario, Think about how you can standardize on those base images and just shift around the model weights itself, so that frozen graph. So if we save this, we can now come back and actually build the Docker container. So I'm just going to do a Docker build. Let me zoom this in a little bit as well. Perfect. Just going to do a Docker build in the current directory, and I'm going to tag it with live demo. Perfect. So that's going to go off, pull those base, uh, base layers, and then just include the graph and the application files itself. So it should be a couple of seconds rather than a couple of minutes to build. Once we've got this, we actually need somewhere to push this up. So I've set up a private Azure Container Registry to store this. And one of the big benefits here is I can push it up and have it stored securely without needing to set, any additional, set up any additional infrastructure. So if I was to actually push this straight up, so I will do a docker tag and tag live demo with our remote container registry name and live demo latest. From here, we can actually push it up and we should be good to go. Now, on the Raspberry Pi itself, while this is happening, I've installed the IoT Edge SDK, which is a small series of files. And it includes a security daemon that makes sure that the Raspberry Pi is in a, correct, in a good configuration state. And it also installs a couple of watchdogs to make sure if anything dies on the Raspberry Pi, it automatically restarts and kicks off again. So I'm going to do a Docker push and push this up to my remote registry. So I've already authenticated, so it should just fly through. When we talk about IoT Edge and central configuration, the whole idea is that we make one configuration change in the cloud and have it pushed to a number of different devices remotely. This means that whether it's one device or a 1,000 devices, it's still just a single action. So we can see that we've only pushed the top file system layer there rather than the entire image. So if we were to come over to the Azure portal now and open up the IoT hub that I've got everything connected up to, we can actually configure this Edge device. So if I go into IoT Edge, select the device, 
scroll down, well, sorry, not scroll down, click Set Modules, and then scroll down to the bottom of the Set Modules screen, I can actually add any deployment modules I like. In this case, I'm going to add a new IoT ed Edge module, which under the hood is a container. So I'm going to call this Vision, paste in my image URI, and that's all I really need. Everything else will be hooked up behind the scenes. But I'm actually going to add an extra option. I'm going to take a port binding and place it in there. So we actually expose a port inside the container itself to the Raspberry Pi. So we can jump on and test to see whether this API is actually working. So if we click Save, next through the rest of the wizard and hit Submit, it's now going to save that configuration to a virtual twin of the device in the cloud. The device is then going to get, it will automatically be notified that changes are available, and it will then pull that down to, to the device itself. So for the sake of the demo, I'm going to jump directly across to the Raspberry Pi itself so we can inspect and see what's happening. So if I do an IoT Edge list, which is the IoT SL, um, IoT Edge CLI, we can actually see that the Vision container is already up and running, and it started up 14 seconds ago. So in terms of making a change within IoT Hub and having those changes replicated to the Edge devices, it's quite quick. We can actually come in here and actually and do a, um, we can look for logs as well. But what I want to test is, is this API actually working? Can we do image prediction on the edge? Well, I can actually call this container in the same way I call custom vision. So I can do a curl, pass in an example image. So I'm going to pass in the image of the carrot that we used previously. And I'm going to pretty print the JSON so we can actually just see it, skip a couple of steps. This is going to take an image locally on the device, send it off to the container that's sitting there. It's going to load up that machine learning model, predict, pull back the results, and give it all back to us in a nice JSON format. And in fact, the, API, the endpoints that it uses and the JSON that it returns is like for like of that of the custom vision service itself. So the only difference between calling an edge module or the custom vision service is the URL. You can literally just point it straight over and it'll work. And we can see here that well, scientific notation makes it a little bit difficult to read. We can see here that we've got very, very low probabilities for most of the, most of the items, except for carrot, where it's 99% sure that, yes, this is in fact a photo of a carrot. Likewise, if we were to give it an avocado instead, so this is the one where we scored very, very low last time. It was around about 88%. We should see a very similar, very similar um, result pop up here. So everything's low, everything's low. There we go. So 77% 70, confidence that it's an avocado. This is really the power of being able to train in the cloud and export to the edge. You can do all the hard work, keep all of your data safe and sound in the cloud itself, and then only pull down two meg of data to actually deploy to the edge itself. So besides just uploading files to it, let's capture from a webcam and stream webcam footage to this container. So I've written a small Python script that actually uses OpenCV to capture images from the webcam and send it to the container. We're running a little bit short on time in terms of the whole presentation. So if you would like the source code and me to go through it a little bit later on, come see me at the end. But if we kick this off, it'll initiate just a consumer grade web webcam. And we can begin to place items in front of it. Now, at the moment, it's saying, I see nothing of interest. It's unable to recognize anything in the image whatsoever. If we were to give it a Granny Smith apple, for example. Well, hopefully it should actually pop up and say, well, now I see a Granny Smith apple. With this edge deployment, TensorFlow under the hood hasn't been compiled for ARM. Hey, there we go. I can see an apple Granny Smith. We could then replace it with a pink lady, for example. So another apple, can it actually tell the difference between the two? 
when it kicks along. Um, the reason it's taking so long is because I've actually got five of these containers <laughs> running on the one Raspberry Pi. And as you know, Raspberry Pis aren't the most powerful devices in the world. I didn't want the demo gods to be angry at me, so I kept a lot of backups. And there we go, we've got Apple Pink Lady showing up ready to go. But what happens if we actually had a couple of different bits and pieces in the same image? Say, for example, I put down an avocado and a carrot on the self-serve checkout at the same time. Well, hopefully we should actually see a result where it detects multiple things within the same image. And I'm not sure if I'm actually in frame. Let's go a carrot instead. I'm the weird fruit guy. I travel around everywhere I go with bags and bags of fruit for demos. So, um, is it going to be on my side? No, it's not. It's not going to pick it up. I'm not going to spend too long here, but with enough training data, it'll be able to pick up multiple items within a single photo and feed that back. Let's give one last go with two different types of apples instead of one. So, my recommendations here as well, while this sample container is great to get started, it's less than performant overall. There are a whole lot of extra optimizations you can put into play to actually get this running a lot faster. And I've got it running up to one to two frames a second on a last generation Raspberry Pi, which is half decent for edge compute. So breaking out of this demo, let's, let's kind of have a bit of a discussion around what what we've seen so far. Yeah. So we've had a look at how to take a model, how to deploy it to the edge, how to execute and run it on the edge. But image classification, to me, is great for some scenarios, but it doesn't solve everything. What we really need here is object detection. As we said before, object detection is a lot more than just labels and probabilities, saying how likely is it that there's an item within an image. Instead, it really looks at bounding boxes. Where is an item within the image itself? So where is the apple? This gives us a lot more information because we can actually pinpoint the number of items within a frame, number of items within an image, and where they are. And you actually get lots and lots of bounding boxes. In the same way that we saw all of the labels returned when we asked what an image was, we get lots and lots of guesses of bounding boxes and confidences of how likely they are to be correct. So running forward a little bit, let's actually spin up object detection rather than just custom vision. So to get started with object detection as opposed to, as opposed to image classification, we can come to the exact same portal and spin up a new project, but instead of clicking the image classification type, we're going to explicitly say object detection. Now, object detection is still in preview, so there are a couple of limits to it that we'll discuss a little bit later on. And I'm gonna call this live, live object and create it. Now, when we looked at annotating and tagging images of apples and potatoes, it was quite easy. We can sort them into folders. When it comes to object detection, though, we need a lot more than just the labels themselves. We need positional information. So if I was to upload, in this case, a photo of a carrot, I don't get a chance to bulk annotate and just add a tag. Instead, I have to go through every single image one by one and select on the image where the object is and mark it as a carrot. Oh, still on the slide? Apologies. All right, let's run through a last couple of seconds there very, very quickly. So within the portal, if we open up and go new project. Under project types, we have the ability to select object detection we're good to go. Once we've got an object detection project, we can then Im import an image in exactly the same way we did before. The last thing we need to do is actually annotate the, that image. So coming through, drawing bounding boxes across our objects and marking them as what they are. Now, you can do this via the portal itself. And 
I highly recommend if you've got a little bit of spare time to go through and do it just as a, just as a bit of a trial run. But you'll find you'll outgrow it very quickly. And this is a kind of another key point. There are a whole lot of image annotation tools that can help you with tagging and annotating large data sets. And that can be everything from automatically suggesting bounding boxes through to live training, where it's automatically training, evaluating, suggesting, and then retraining based on the tags you've put in play. In this example, though, I'm actually going to use the visual object tagging tool by Microsoft. And the reason I like this tool is because it actually stores all the tags in a platform agnostic format. So it just stores it as a massive JSON file. So it means whether you're using custom vision or TensorFlow or CNTK or any framework you want, you can tag once, reuse everywhere. So I've gone through and tagged 307 images of all different types of fruit and veg. If you'd like a copy of the data set, let me know so you don't have to go through the same thing again. And we really have a whole lot of different images containing both single and multiple bits of fruit. From here, we can actually export it directly into the Custom Vision portal. So we don't even need to worry about writing a plugin between the two. So if I remove this live object project and grab my training key, we can actually use that to upload. So I'm going to delete live object. Now, there is a bit of a quirk with the visual object training tool in that it will want to create a project with its own name. So I'm going to come in here, select custom vision service and paste in my training key. This is going to go through now and actually begin uploading all those images on my behalf. If we come back to the custom vision portal, we should actually see now a brand new project. My loads, brand new project called VOTT export, which contains all of those annotations in the custom vision format. So we didn't need to translate it at all. And it's going to go through and it's going to sit there for a couple of minutes, because as we say, it's 307 images of varying quality. But from here, we train an object detection model in the exact same way. There we go, we're finished. We can open up our export, click the train button, and it will perform all the training operations for us. Using VMs and whatnot under the hood, we don't really care. We don't have to manage that infrastructure. Now, for 307 images on object detection, it does take about five to six minutes, give or take how many people are using the service at once. So instead of spending too much time here, I'm actually going to jump across to a pre-trained model on the exact same images. So I've got an object detection project over here generated by exactly the same mechanism. So exactly the same data set, even that same first image. So if we come to the Performance tab, we can see that we've got our iteration. But we also have a third, uh, third metric or third, third piece of information that we need to have a bit of a think about. And that's how accurate the bounding boxes were. Now, all of these descriptions are very, very generalized and not too detailed. But the whole idea is we should be able to infer what's happening here rather than know what's happening below, behind the scenes with the machine learning model. The same way as we did before, we can click on Quick Test and provide it with, in this case, our sample images we had before with bad lighting, edges wrong. And you'll note here we actually get three boxes. Remember before where I said object detection gives you lots and lots of bounding boxes? Well, if I turn the probability threshold all the way down, we get a lot of boxes. This is where in the same way we used confidences before to determine what the image was, we need to use confidences again to determine how likely it is that that object is in this image. So by turning the threshold up to, say, 61%, you'll notice we're only left with one item in there, a carrot predicted with 95.8% probability. In the same way, we can grab an avocado, pass it through, and we get an avocado. 
It's remembered my threshold so I don't need to reset it. So that's object detection from new project to fully working model, once again in give or take five minutes time. This, unless, unless you've got a really big background in data science, it isn't really possible with off-the-shelf frameworks. So how do we use this? Well, in the same way we saw a training API before, there's a predictions API that we can actually call custom vision with. So we use the training API to upload the original image set back in the very first example. We can now use the prediction API to actually predict what's happening. So I've got a small program here that sets up a thread for webcam capture and a thread for predictions. And it's just so that it doesn't slow down OpenCV when it's doing its thing. What we're going to do is every two to, uh, two to three times a frame, we're going to take a copy of what's on the webcam, send it up to the custom vision service, have it evaluate, and send us back down the results. From there, we're actually going to display it on screen. In reality, what this looks like is taking in a buffer, an image, calling predict image with no store. So we're not, we're not wanting to store the results of whether this was successful or not. And then we get back those bounding boxes in the same way we got them in the UI. So I'm going to kick this guy off. And we should actually be able to now point the laptop towards the apples and have it recognize the different apples within the image itself. I just realized I didn't set up my startup project for the second time this presentation. Cool. Awesome. So we get our webcam feed. And the webcam feed's happening at about 20 frames per second. Um, as I said before, the image upload is a little bit slower, but there we go. Hey. And we can begin to throw more and more items in. Now, you'll notice that the probability threshold is set a little bit low here because we're getting a carrot on the left-hand side. And this is where it is a little bit of an art in terms of picking those thresholds. If I was to move this across a little bit, I'm pretty sure it will actually kick that out of the image. Yeah, there we go. So I've successfully grabbed a carrot, pink lady apple, and a granny smith apple. So we've been able to tell the difference between two apples, even though they look pretty much the same. And this even works right down to things like avocados and whatever we've actually trained our data set on. That's not an onion. <laughs> now, I love this because I always say something big and fabulous like that. There we go, avocado. What I've actually got with this data set, which is rather interesting, and I'd like to take a couple of seconds to discuss, is it's very biased. There isn't a lot of difference in terms of the fruit and veg inside there. They're not on different backgrounds. They're not shot with different lighting conditions. It's very, very particular about the data set that I've put in. And in return, I get very particular results out. Um, there's certain names for this, like overfitting and whatnot. But having a biased data set when you're only taking a certain environmental setting into consideration really affects the output that you get. So what I'm actually doing every time I show off a demo similar to this, I'm actually capturing all these images. And then I'm going to take them back and use them to retrain the model again to basically make it more aware of different lighting conditions, different environments, whether it's halogen or LED lights in the ceiling, that sort of thing. So close that guy off. Let's jump back and have a bit of a, bit of a recap and finish up. So object detection is fantastic, but I just want everyone to be aware there are some limitations to it. The big kickers are it's still in preview. It's only been out a couple of months. And as such, there's no paid tiers or SLAs for it. So you're kind of at the limit of, at, yeah, at the mercy of the rate limits that are in play. So you notice there I was only processing two or three frames per second. If I hit it too aggressively, it'll actually say, we'll slow down a second. When it's released and actually available as a paid service, you can hit a lot more aggressively. And I've had coworkers stream up to 10 to 15 frames a second up to custom vision to do classification. And it handled it without any issues at all. There's also no ability to export object detection models at the moment. 
Now, cognitive services as a whole is a really interesting concept. We have all this power of machine learning and AI at our fingertips without actually needing to know how the models work. And at its core, I really consider cognitive services as a development accelerator. Using APIs instead of fighting with frameworks. We shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel every time we want to do image recognition or natural, natural language understanding. They're great for proof of concepts and production services alike, and a super low barrier to entry. Are they the solution to every single problem? Not necessarily. So what happens when you find something that's beyond cognitive services? And I'm really talking about the image recognition and computer vision area here. Well, you've got things like the Azure Machine Learning Platform Services, which are fantastic. You gain more control, but you still don't have to worry about managing VMs. But what if you still find that isn't enough? Well, that's when you can look at breaking out the frameworks. And there's nothing wrong with breaking out TensorFlow or CNTK. You can apply the same things that we've done here to those, gaining more control, but having greater responsibility. We've managed to deploy this model and get it up and running over an API without even thinking about patching, monitor, monitoring, HR, DA, productionizing the service itself. That's handled for us. So when we want to move beyond object detection, this is a little bit more of an interesting concept. Well, we could look at things like rotated bounding boxes. When we looked at images of carrots, a carrot doesn't really fit into a square or a rectangle. It's rotated at an angle. So it's closer to the actual shape. And ex in extension of this, you can actually look at polygonal segmentation, where you actually draw the outline of the object itself. Now, with each of these, they become more and more computationally intense, meaning that the power to drive them, uh, you basically, at the point of doing mask RNN, for example, as, as a model, you do need a GPU. Otherwise, you're right down at a minute or so to generate a single frame. These do give you fine-grained shapes, though. A great example of where this is used is on mapping services to actually determine the shape of a house. You can use machine learning to actually pick up what, what shape is the house itself. And another cool concept, and this is what I'm playing with at the moment, is different final layers. Instead of just outputting, is it an apple, is it an orange? Where is the apple in this image? How about reading the value off a dial, representing a color as an output, or outputting an emoji? The final step is complete custom models. And I like to put this in because everything that we've looked at today does serve a purpose. And it's a great tool to have in your arsenal. But there are situations where you will need to break out data scientist mode and do everything down to the lowest layer. So to finish up, I've got a bit of a challenge for everyone in the room. I want you to give custom vision a go. I want you to start with just a few images and see what you can make happen. And as an extension of that, have a play around with the cognitive services. There's free trials available on the website itself, so you don't even need to sign up. And I really feel that custom vision has such a low barrier to entry that even people that don't have a programming background can begin doing image classification tasks straight away. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you. Hopefully you've enjoyed today. And yeah, any questions at all? Cool. I was about to say we've got five minutes. Uh, yes. It's not on any public roadmaps. <laughs> but let's go with that. Um, uh, object detection um, at the edge, so being able to export those models and run them anywhere. Um, it's currently not on the public roadmap. Um, with, with anything this time of year, keep an eye out for Ignite happening next week. There's normally a couple of announcements and bits and pieces, though it is a very, very heavily requested feature. If you do find you're in that sort of scenario, you can just fall back straight to TensorFlow, and there's a whole lot of examples on how to do that. But it's not as nice as as a service. Cool. Yes. Are you 
Ah, so the exported component that you get is actually converted from its internal format to TensorFlow. The reason it originally started as TensorFlow is the Docker file option wasn't originally there. TensorFlow was just a way to actually run these models on an Android phone. The original release of Custom Vision Export was just to run on phones, not on edge devices. So a whole lot of people actually started playing around with TensorFlow as a model format. And soon enough, everyone was exporting Android phone images from Custom Vision to run them in a number of different scenarios. You can force it into CNTK if you'd like to do that. Um, I haven't heard on any official CNTK export formats. Good question. <laughs> um, it's, it's kind of magic source. Um, I can assume CNTK from the way the layers are described and the output names seem very, very much default CNTK labels, but there isn't any, yeah, it's not a, not a published thing. So as I say, CNTK is what I assume, but yeah. Cool. All right, we'll leave it there. Feel free to come up and grab a piece of fruit or veg if you'd like. <laughs> I've got two avocados if anyone really wants smashed avo in the afternoon. And yeah, have a great rest of the day.